the youth collection development team for Ingram Library Services. Prior to that, I was doing collection development for both the New York Public Library and Brooklyn Public Library. I've served on a bunch of award committees where um, my most recent was the We Need Diverse Books Walter 2020 Award. Might be my new favorite thing. So now onto the good stuff. The library market is one of the largest and fastest growing in comics. Prior to COVID-19, the library comics market experienced multiple successes such as the million plus initial print runs of Raina Telgemeier and Dave Pilkey's newest titles, as well as Jerry Craft's Newberry Win the New Kid, which I love. So great job, Newberry Committee. And also in the growth in adult comics readership, especially in graphic medicine and award winners, like my favorite thing is monsters. It seems that comics and graphic novels are taking libraries by storm. However, there are still challenges in getting quality graphic novels into libraries and into patrons' hands. Some librarians are gatekeepers and don't make the graphic novels as easily accessible as some of their other materials. Or some may think that graphic novels are just for one kind of reader. Some may be unfamiliar with the medium altogether and are unsure of how to recommend titles um, to their patrons. So I hope during our discussion this afternoon, we can address some of these issues and how publishers and libraries can grow together now and a COVID-19 future. Um, a few housekeeping notes. For any questions that you would like to ask, please use the Q&A feature that Zoom has instead of chat. We should have some time at the end of our panel to answer some questions at the end. And for those of you watching live, this webinar is being recorded and will be available with any links that we've discussed and links to all the publishers catalogs on GNCRT's YouTube channel in approximately a week or so. So now I'll let everyone introduce themselves and then we'll dig into some questions. So let's start with Gina Gagliano. Hi everyone, I'm Gina Gagliano. I'm the publishing director of Random House Graphic, which is Random House's dedicated kids and YA graphic novel publisher. We're pretty new. We started publishing books just in January and our sixth title came out last week. Uh, we publish everything from graphic novels from age four up through uh, books for people who are just starting college. And our motto is a graphic novel on every bookshelf, which means uh, every genre, all the age categories of kids and teens and reaching every, every different reader. All right, and next let's do uh, Jack Cohen. Hi everyone, I'm Jack Cohen from Fanographics uh, Books in Seattle, Washington. We are the longest running uh, independent graphic novel publishing house uh, with 45 years of publishing comics. Um, we primarily focus on comics for adults uh, and have been since 1976. Uh, we uh, also have um, a line of uh, classic ar archival comics, which are bread and butter, which many people know us for um, including the complete peanuts and um, many Disney books. Uh, but uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, and how about Arun Singh? Yeah, hi, I'm Arun Singh, uh, VP Marketing at Boom Studios. So we actually celebrate our 15th anniversary uh, next June. Not as impressive as those numbers, Jack, but uh, <laughs> we're trying to catch up. Uh, so we, yeah, we publish, our motto is we believe comics are for anyone, so we make them for everyone. So we do that through four curated imprints, our Kaboom imprint, which is for early readers, uh, early to middle grade readers, our Boombox imprint, which is for YA audiences, our Boom Studios imprint, which serves a tradi more traditional, I think, comic book market and age range. And then our Archaea imprint, which goes everywhere from early readers to adults with a lot of uh, ambitious and challenging artistic expressions with comic book medium. So we, we want to make something for everybody because we want everyone, as Gina says and Jack has said, uh, and I'm sure as Kevin will say, uh, we want everyone to feel included and in, um, in part of the comic experience because comics are the best. That's why we're here today. All right. And last but not least, let's um, Kevin Hamrick, please. Hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Hamrick. I'm the Vice President of Publishing Sales for Viz Media. Uh, Viz Media is the world's largest English language Pub uh, manga publisher. We are owned by the two largest publishers in Japan, Shueisha and Shigakan. And we bring uh, manga over from Japan, translated in English, 
and make it available. And just like everybody else, we want to make it available to everybody from ages five to 85. We publish Pokemon, uh, Splatoon. Uh, we are the publisher of the, the, the best-selling series in the world right now, which is My Hero Academia. Um, and uh, we're 34 years old next month. So uh, we've kind of gotten a handle on how to do this. Okay, so we're gonna start with an easy icebreaker question. Do you have one backlist or like new to the public title that you don't want um, the public to miss? And then what's one upcoming title that is the one that they definitely can't miss? So let's um, start. Okay, Gina. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the, the new book that I wanna talk to you about is Lucy Nicely's Stepping Stones, which just came out this month and we got an amazing review for it in the New York Times this weekend, which is super exciting. Um, so Lucy is a New York Times bestselling memoirist and she's doing her first kids graphic novel with us and her first book that is uh, fiction rather than autobiography, though it's still heavily inspired by her life. And it's the story of her, um, and her parents getting divorced when she was in middle school. Um, her parents separated, her mom moved her from New York City to upstate New York to live on a farm and started dating a guy who had two kids her age of his own. So it's about integrating into a new family structure, figuring out a new, a new family dynamic for herself. And um, it's just smart and touching and lovely. Um, you know, Jack's published Lucy at Fanographics as well. She's just like, she's an amazing author, whatever she's doing. And we're so delighted to be bringing her into the kids space and telling her like really um, heartfelt and heartwarming and personal stories for these readers. Um, and then on the upcoming front, we have a book this fall called The Magic Fish by Chang Lin Nguyen which is the story of a kid who is Vietnamese American. His parents are immigrants and he's struggling to try to come out to them when he doesn't know the words for being gay in Vietnamese. And he's not sure that his parents will understand if he tells them in English. Um, so they connect with each other through reading fairy tales together every night. Um, so he improves his Vietnamese when his parents tell him stories and his, his parents improve his English when he reads to them. And so the, the book is all about um, intergenerational connection and uh, coming closer together. And it's really fantastic. I think, I think you're all going to love it. That sounds really great. How about um, Jack? Uh, I guess, um... It would be amiss if I didn't mention my favorite thing is Monsters, since that is definitely um, <laughs> one of our um, breakthrough titles that we've published in the last five years. Um, Emil Ferris, uh, this is her debut book um, at the age of 56. It is a um, story about a young girl who is a makeshift kind of detective trying to figure out the um, murder of her beautiful neighbor. Um, and while she's discovering the history of her neighbor who who was killed, uh, she also discovers her own sexuality. Um, and uh, it um, is a staple among all libraries and should be, I should think it should be required reading for anybody over the age of 18. Um, please don't read it if you're younger because there's a lot of graphic um, images in it. Um, but uh, it, um, is definitely a, a really good entry point for somebody who might not necessarily be familiar with reading comics because it is a very rich story. Um, and then uh, for upcoming titles, uh, we have a book releasing uh, this summer called Dancing After 10 by uh, Vivian Chong and Georgia Weber. It is a graphic medicine title, which is um, nonfiction. Um, graphic medicine, in case people are not familiar, are graphic novels um, that are concerned with health and wellness um, and talk discuss illnesses. Uh, Vivian Chong um, got something called toxic, called 10 for short, I'm not gonna try to pronounce <laughs> it, um, which um, 
was a side effect of ibuprofen, this over-the-counter pain medicine, and um, went blind. And before she went blind, she started quickly drawing the first part of a graphic memoir about her life. And uh, she teamed up with George Weber, who previously released uh, Dumb, Living Without a Voice, a story about her graphic medicine story about um, trying to cope with a very rare uh, genetic condition that causes pain when she speaks. Uh, so uh, Vivian uh, wrote most of the story and Georgia collaborated with her to complete it. Um, it's nonfiction, it's definitely adult oriented, uh, but uh, it really is a, a triumph of a tale of overcoming difficulties um, and the healing power of art, which right now with the world that we're living in seems to be a really important way for people to kind of process what they're dealing with. Now oh, they sound fascinating and some, we can't go wrong with any more own voices stories. So I'm really excited about those. Um, how about Kevin? Well, for the uh, ongoing series for most, I probably have to go with My Hero Academia, which now is uh, over 5 million copies in print across uh, 24 volumes. Volume 24 comes out next week. Um, it's a story of a academy, a high school of uh, talented youngsters who all have superpowers and how they have to learn to use those superpowers uh, for themselves and with others. Um, it is the number one selling manga in the world and we have now translated it into 27 different languages. Um, but the, the title coming up this fall that we're most excited about is Fangirl. I probably don't have to tell any librarian out there about Fangirl, uh, but we are taking it with Rainbow Rowell and, and it's being adapted into manga by Sam Maggs. Sam Maggs is writing for Marvel right now doing uh, Captain Marvel and a, a new YA novel for them. But we are going to take the fangirl story and put it over four volumes in manga format. First volume comes out this October, two in 2021 and the last volume in 2022. So we're very, very excited about this one. Those sound great. Um, Arun? Yeah, uh, I was going to say My Hero Academia. I love it so much, but you stole it from me, Kevin. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, you can have a copy or two. <laughs> uh, no, I think uh, I'm going to cheat and say, since everyone has Lumberjanes, um, the, uh, the backlist title or recent release I, I'd recommend is Big Black Stand at Attica. Uh, much like Jack gave the disclaimer, uh, if, you're not under, if you're not over 18 uh, or at least a mature teenager, I'm not sure I'd read this. It's very graphic. It's It's... Uh, co-written by Frank Big Black Smith and uh, by Jared Reinmuth with art by Emetziani, I think if I'm saying it correctly. And it tells uh, the true story of the Attica uprising um, in New York State, uh, written, co-written by Frank Smith before he passed. Um, he was at the center of it. He helped, helped keep the peace between the guards and the prisoners when they rose up for equal treatment and fair treatment while incarcerated. It's an incredibly powerful book uh, and one I can't recommend more. Uh, for an upcoming release, uh, I would say A Thief Among the Trees, which is an Ember in the Ashes prequel graphic novel uh, written by Saba Tahir and, uh, and by Nicole Andelfinger. Uh, and it is a, uh, it is an app. If you're a fan of Ember in the Ashes, which so many people are, it's the first time it's been adapted. It's the first time we've told those stories in graphic novel form. And so it is... Uh, it is uh, an incredible story if you're a longtime fan, but if you're like me and admittedly and new to the world Seba created, it's, inc it's still incredibly inviting for you. So uh, that's absolutely uh, my recommendation for an upcoming title and that comes out in July. You're speaking to my YA soul right there. <laughs> All right, so um, next, sort of what I alluded to in our intro, graphic novels have been around for decades. However, a lot of people think, still think of them as a new medium and it isn't a real book or they're only for that you know, specific kind of reader. I'm cringing as I say this. So what would you like to say to those librarians? I love this one. Um, so Fantagraphics is, again has been publishing comics and graphic novels for over 45 years. We literally wrote the book on it called We Told You So, Comics is Art. Um, I mean, comics are stories told sequentially on paper bound between two covers. Like what part of that doesn't sound like a real book? Um, reading a comic is both the act of uh, reading and watching. 
um, that I think comics are a higher form of reading because one has to engage both the left and right side of the brain to comprehend a story. Um, and I could go into a lot more detail about that, which I won't to uh, spare everyone the lecture. <laughs> Uh, I have I given that lecture to people that would come into the library and say, no, 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 kids, you know, your mom wants you to read a real book. And I was like, no, 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 these make you smarter, both sides of the brain. Let me show you some studies. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, as a kid in, in grade five, because I grew up in Canada, so that's how we say things. Uh, in grade five, I was a C student in English, and I, my mom would have me read books, like I read the Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew and stuff during the summer or whatever. And once I started reading comics, I actually found that my vocabulary expanded, like using superheroes as an example. I didn't know what the words gambit or rogue meant until I read a superhero comic about them and it forced <laughs> me to interrogate these words. And it's amazing. Look, Magneto is not a real word, but I guess it is. Um, but I would say if someone is, is apprehensive about, about graphic novels or doesn't think they're a medium, I would just say, look at the variety of books that all of us just recommended. There's no overlap in, in tone. There's no overlap in story, but the overlap is Everyone here has some, like any of these books, you know, dozens of people come to your library who'd love to read them because they read, uh, they read prose books that have similar themes or similar characters or have similar perspectives. And I would just say, reach out to any comics publisher and they'd be happy to show you what we have to offer you that, uh, that rivals any entertainment medium. Like I said at the beginning, I think, and I think everyone here, here agrees, comics are the best. So uh, make your library the best, put more graphic novels in there. And I also think it's important to look at your patrons and what they're interested in. You know, any library and librarian is there to serve the readers at your library. And you know, looking around the state of books in America where every national chain bookstore has a graphic novel section. Every indie bookstore has a graphic novel section. Many of them have two because they have an adult and a kid's one or three because they have sometimes two or three kids sections. If you're looking at that and not seeing a space for that at your library, I think that you need to look again at what you're doing with your library, given the popularity of comics with these uh, with these readers, with these new readers today. Um, you know, sometimes it can definitely be a learning curve to go from being a person who mainly reads prose, who mainly buys prose for your library, to also reading comics. Um, but that's just the same way that looking at any format or genre, you're not going to instantly get it by you know, seeing a, a comic or a fantasy book or a romance novel or a medical text once in your life. Like it, it requires work to get on top of comics and what they are as a category and, you know, how great that we all think that they are. Um, but there's, there's lots of ways to do that as librarians, including looking at the resources that the graphic novel and comics roundtable has for you, or also working with the library staff or your patrons to figure out what comics are best for everyone at the library that you work at. Yeah, picking up um, what Jeannie just said, you know, use your patrons. Um, yes, it's, it can be a little daunting if you don't understand the category, uh, but if you can, you know, talk to your local comic shop, you know, talk to your patrons. I'm sure there's one person who would love in your area who would love to help you develop a, a category. Um, and they, they're, they're a wealth of knowledge. Use, use them. Yes, there are a lot of books out there, graphic novels, comics, and manga. I mean, one of our series is 94 volumes long right now. Obviously, space becomes an issue. But there are ways to get around that. And we as publishers are here to help you as well. OK, one so thing I just want to add real fast, that something that people seem to have um, forgotten is that uh, comics for adults are growing all the time. Um, I mean, Gina has been laying the groundwork for comics for children in YA for what, over a decade now in publishing. Um, and I think it's really important to have those readers who are growing up with comics to then grow into reading adult comics and not just getting stuck in, um, um, leaving comics behind once they, you know, graduate high school. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's important for librarians to really look at the 
huge range of books that are available for all different kinds of readers. And the, the storylines continue to develop into bigger, better, bolder, more uh, succinct storylines. And again, for, for adults as well. So it's, it's, it's an industry, it's, it's a genre category that has grown over the, to the, over the years and has taken advantage of the growing readership out there. I'd also add one more thing too while we're doing this is that, you know, uh, I think that comics have been a place in culture typically where uh, things have happened first, where there's been more inclusivity, where there's been um, more diversity of characters, more diversity of content. And uh, I think it is, if you're looking for what's going to be big in pop culture next, if you're looking for the big trends, you almost always see it in in comics first. And that's because uh, the people who get into comics just love it so much and that they they don't limit themselves by genre, by age group, by category. They, they just put out what they love and there's a less of a barrier to creating those stories. There's no special effects budget. Yes, there's budgets to make comics, but there isn't, there aren't the same barriers you might find uh, anywhere else. And these days with, with the internet, it's even easier than ever to share those comic stories. And we were all talking beforehand, but you can have a case of something that starts on the internet, like check please, that turns into a giant sensation in bookstores and libraries everywhere. So the moral of the story is graphic novels are real books and please stock your libraries. So with the suspension of diamond distribution and the physical closures of libraries, how are comics publishers reaching the library market? Well, I think that um, this webinar is a great example. Um, as, as all of us are dealing with COVID-19, um, there, there's been a big move into the virtual space. Not that all of us didn't have websites and social media and newsletters and all of that before, but now more than ever, we are figuring out connecting to each other, connecting to librarians, connecting to readers um, all through this space, um, you know, as well as, of course, still valuing the the print books that we do and the physical connection that and you know the in-person meetings that we we have it's just um uh, those are those are uh, a little down the, the road at this point uh fanographics is participating in day of dialogue uh library journals um a big conference uh that is usually um right before BookCon or BEA, uh, but now it's gonna be virtual. Um, plus there's various programming that we're putting together for ALA annual, which is now the virtual conference. So I think keeping on top of open lines of communication in this new way of uh, talking to people face to face via computer. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. I'm oh, sorry, I was gonna try to unmute myself. I apologize. <laughs> took a second. I was gonna say a lot of what we're doing at Boom, and I'm sure it's true for all of us. Is and Gina uh, touched on it. Is we've been working at uh, increasing as our personal outreach, and it's not just newsletters and and beyond the conferences. Working and reaching out to all the librarians we know to curate our solutions for them because every market's different, right? Some libraries may be open, forced open um, to some degree, or they may have more patrons than others. So we're really trying to work with them to make sure that they have. Um, they have curated solutions from us. They have all the PDFs they need. They have all the other assets. And like Jack said, working and uh, participating in these kind of events just to make sure that uh, librarians know that we are going to keep new books coming for them as they need them to satisfy their patrons. Yeah. Viz, um, we've been with more direct contact with the libraries lately. We're distributed by Simon and Schuster, and they're they're. Library Salesforce has been in contact with everybody as well, and uh, making sure that uh, you know those libraries that can get books are either getting them from Simon Schuster, or from Follett, or from Ingram. But uh, we've also made available more channels of communication. So some libraries have still been able to order titles while working remotely. Have you seen a shift in what libraries have been asking for? Yes, actually, <laughs> new titles are still going out um, at a, a relatively steady rate, um, which is encouraging to see. But uh, we have noticed an increase in interest in our classic um, archival comic collections. Um, the best guess I have for this is we're seeing a lot of interest from parents who are now spending more time with their 
children now that they're homeschooled and are able to share their favorite classic stories from when they were young. Um, so I think it's a combo of adults reaching into their nostalgia for comfort in a time that feels scary, uh, but also um, with uh, parents being able to share something that they genuinely love with their kids now that they have so much more time on their hands that everyone's homeschooling. Yeah, we've. I think that's a jacket on a great point, which is uh, with parents being home and kids being home, we've seen a dramatic increase in, in interest. And I'm sure, Gina, you've seen this too for, for early and middle grade titles, because I think uh, not only is there nostalgia for specific titles, as Jack mentioned, but there's more, um, there's more opportunity to share comics and share that love for comics with kids. So for example, Lumberjanes, which is a book that sold millions of copies, and you would think everybody has enough has seen, has been, has been seeing huge increases in sales over the last few months because more people are sharing it with their kids or kids, I guess, who didn't own a copy, maybe borrowed it from a friend, have their own copies now. And so that is um, that has been a huge area of growth for us. Uh, even with new titles like All My Friends Are Ghosts or Heavy Vinyl, we've just seen such a uh, incredible interest in that category specifically. And we've seen a lot of uh, interest in volume ones and volume twos, which hopefully means more people are getting into new series. Um, but it, it's been some of the, the great backlist series that we have like One Piece or Naruto, but a lot of our, our newer series as well. But we've also seen an uptick in sports manga, including haiku, and our literary, our high-end uh, manga, which is mainly for 18 and 20 and above. So we're, we're hoping that those are the parents who are, are picking up on, on uh, some books that they haven't read yet. And as well as the kids comic sales, I am also hearing about increased sales in nonfiction graphic novels as well for, for kids in YA. Um, and presumably that is teachers and librarians and parents who are interested in expanding their educational bookshelf. Gina, you touched on a question that I was going to ask later, which was basically, I was going to ask if there was an increase in nonfiction graphic novels since parents and kids are home and being homeschooled, if the, any of you had noticed an increase in the demand for any of those, but you just answered that. So sometimes comics often require hand selling at cons and conferences. So what are the strategies that you're using now that you can't technically hand sell them? I think uh, for, for us, like conventions were, were certainly hand selling was part of it. And we love the experience at our booth and sales are, are, it's always a fun experience. But the main reason we went to conventions was to connect with people and to connect with those fans and see what they were interested in, to connect at panels, to the various round tables, to see many of the people here on this call and catch up. And so, uh, we found that that's just pivoted for us. That's pivoted into the digital space because social media is able to replicate much of, not all of it, but much of that experience. So for example, recently we had a uh, hashtag boost your LCS event on social media, which was meant to drive traffic to comic stores. And what we did was we had people reach out to boom studios on Twitter and let us know what books you liked. And we, based on a curated list of books said, you know what, here's a perfect book for you. Sent them a free PDF. All they had to do was show us they had just shopped at their comics shop in the last couple of months. And we gave them the, uh, we gave them the first issue so that they could start an adventure of discovering their new favorite comic. As Kevin mentioned, there's a, I think we're all taking time to go through that to-do list of reading or things we said we'd watch or read. And uh, we're finding a lot of people are interested in our new volume number ones. And so, getting those PDFs out there to people for free, getting more material out to them, making sure they know the variety of graphic novels that exist um, has, been, has been hugely successful for us in replicating, I think one of the strengths of, of conventions, which is everyone just comes in hungry for something new. They just want to discover their next cool thing and, and get that hit again of discovering a new thing. And I think there's a lot we can do to replicate that on social media. Um, Fanographics is, uh currently relaunching our website um, so we can better serve uh, like direct consumer sales, which we've noticed people are really craving these days because we aren't able to have that connection with them at festivals and, and conventions. Um, so we're making the site more inviting of like a shopping experience for, for people, but we're also developing um, new features to connect readers uh, to titles that 
pique their interest based on um, like revamp, or sorry, re, uh, pique their interest uh, based on um, books or TV shows or movies or bands or, you know, et cetera, of things that they, that they like. Um, so it's shifting hand selling to a digital platform. Um, and then, you know, doubling our social media to share like both our new titles, but also highlighting like all of our backlist um, with our new to you um, uh, uh, hashtag that we've been really, really successful with. And that's again, like connecting 45 years of publishing with um, people who might be newer to reading comic books. We're also looking at the activities and resources that both librarians and teachers and parents can use in their home, sharing them on social media and building out more materials and working with our parent company, Random House Children's Books, to um, combine them with the materials they're producing for their prose titles as well. So graphic novels are included in um, the, their own space, but also in the um, overall children's book space. And just like everybody else at, at Viz Media, the, the digital and social platforms we're expanding upon, but we're also, you know, using our, our newsletter, our dedicated li library newsletter database uh, to much better use, but also using Edelweiss and NetGalley and seeing that they're, during this crisis, a lot more librarians are taking advantage of NetGalley and Edelweiss as well. So since you're passing um, information digitally, I mean, what does this mean for like awards lists where they don't actually accept digital copies or your um, previously scheduled like book tours and convention appearances? Like how are you working all of that in this new virtual world? Well, at Viz Media, we were gonna be bringing our, obviously our authors are all Japanese and they live in Japan. Uh, for some of the bigger conventions this summer, we were going to bring some pretty big authors over, creators over. Uh, we are now working with those conventions to see what we might, might be able to do virtually. As far as getting uh, books into the reviewers' hands for the awards, obviously we'd rather get the printed books into their hands, but the Eisners are allowing uh, digital copies. So we provided digital copies for our nominated Eisner Award books. Uh, going to say that I don't think we've actually ever had a significant challenge with um, submitting uh, virtually. Uh, generally, I found if uh, most people have been pretty understanding, though, as Kevin said, I'm sure everyone here agrees that the tactile sensation and the experience of reading a comic can't be replicated if it's not physical. And I say that as a, someone who reads a lot of digital comics, uh, the physical experience is definitely the best. Uh, so we, uh, what we have done throughout the years generally is we'll, as we know, we think we're going to submit a book the, the next year. We've been we, we just increase our print run to have enough copies for the various awards. I think at this juncture right now, um, we're so, like Kevin said, everyone's allowing digital submissions. So it hasn't been an issue. I gotta say kudos to all the, everybody running awards who's, who's been so flexible because I'm sure it's been difficult for all of them as well. We're still submitting hard copies. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I just, uh, our, our, most of our books are hardcover. Um, uh, our, I think 99% of our books are drawn with ink and paper, and that means that they have to be read with ink and paper. Uh, we, we do sell digital comics and we do distribute digital comics, but that's just not really the way our, our books are, are really meant to be read. Um, you know, 250 page graphic novels, not easy to read on an iPad. Uh, so um, all of our lovely committee members on all these award uh, uh, committees were are getting hard copies from us. So thanks FedEx. <laughs> yeah, we, um, we both have been seeing that awards committees have been taking digital copies and um, our warehouse is still open. They're still mailing books. So where that's not happening, we can submit physical copies as well. Um, with book tours and convention appearances, uh, it kind of runs the gamut. A lot of stuff, as um, Kevin and Arun said, we're, we're doing virtually or we're exploring different opportunities rather than, you know, have a virtual convention. Maybe we do a blog tour, we do media in a different way, we take a different tack to a book, or we think about another time to do something um, looking at school visits or virtual school visits in the fall instead of doing them in the spring or connecting with the, the audience that we would be reaching in a different and virtual way. 
So I'm going to do a little shameless plug because since we're talking about awards, most people do know about the Eisner and the Harvey Awards, but I'm thinking most people don't know that the GNCRT is actually working on creating the GNCRT best graphic novels for adults. And so Yalsa already has the great graphic novels for teens. So this is all really very exciting. So I just can't wait. Um, the next question is for Gina, but anyone else could jump in. Um, with your relatively new imprint, Random House Graphic, how are you getting the word out to libraries? Yeah, so it's definitely interesting to be starting an imprint this year. Um, <laughs> Luckily, I'm not alone in that. There's a whole lot of other publishers that I know who have started at imprints in the past 12 months. And so um, I, I feel like I have like a occasional like coffee clashes with a lot of other publishers to just be like, how is this working? What are you doing? And everyone, everyone's very smart and kind and thoughtful. Um, and I mean, the thing about starting as an imprint is that um, it's it's not just a like one day sort of uh, one and done announcement. Um, I I started working at Random House Graphic two years ago last week, and everything that I've done since then has been part of the roll up to us starting to publish books this year. Um, so doing that has been everything from going to conventions and having launch parties and doing media and doing book announcements to hiring staff and starting our social media and launching a website and a newsletter. Um, so that's all happening. And of course, the biggest thing that we can do is publish books and share them with readers and promote the wonderful authors that we work with who are the most important part of the whole, the whole process. So, you know, really what we do to promote our imprint and its existence is publish the best books that we can and uh, make sure that they get out there to readers in as, as strong a way as, as we can make happen. Um, I just wanted to remind all the attendees that if they have any questions they'd like to ask this panel um, to use the Q&A feature to submit them and we will um, get to them at the end of the session. Um, so that's the very most important question I wanna ask you is what does your COVID-19 workspace look like and do you have any furry coworkers? Arun, is your cat going to visit? <laughs> this is Katniss. Katniss, <laughs> say hi. She, yes, she, I'm very literary minded. She was named after Katniss Everdeen because when she was uh, rescued, she was rescued with her brother. Uh, we got her in New York when we used to live there. And so she's missing, she has one eye. She's missing the other one because uh, it was infected. But she's, she can be a little bit of a handful, but she's a fighter and she's a survivor. And she's my little hero. So she's Katniss. <laughs> So she says hi. Wave hi, Katniss. See, she waved. Hi, Katniss. And I'd like to just shout out Philip Sablik, who challenged me, our president and publisher, to get eight, one of my cats on the video. Challenge accepted. <laughs> this is John. Uh, he's a lionhead rabbit. He's a, I work at a rabbit rescue shelter, and he's one of our more difficult rescues. Um, and uh, he has a heart condition, so he's on special meds, but he spends most of his day or in and around my living room with me. Um, so yeah, it doesn't, he has both of his eyes, um, but uh, <laughs> so Katniss has one up on him. But uh, yeah, it's nice to spend extra time with the, with the babies. <laughs> is he as soft and fuzzy as he looks? Yeah, yeah, he is. He has this big mane of, of fur on top of his head, very flock of seagulls, 80s hair. Um, <laughs> And I'm ensconced in my uh, home office um, for the past 12 weeks and will be for the next three months. Um, but uh, I do have a one-year-old golden doodle who is upstairs sleeping right now because he gets very jealous when we're on video calls. Um, so he would, he would not be letting me uh, talk to you if he was down here while I'm trying to talk to y'all. 
Um, and I am here in my workspace. I don't have any furry animals. I'm allergic to them, but I do have an ice cream machine. So that it has like, this is a different purpose, but it is also a very good sort of working from home companion. You might be winning. <laughs> um, so we talked about a lot of things this afternoon. And for the librarians that are still struggling with curating and recommending graphic novels, I would suggest using ALA's GN CRT Lib Comics online resources, such as the Guide to Reading Library Comics at Home, the Adult Graphic Novel Reading List, Lib Comics RA Reader's Advisory Forum. I would also suggest that if any of you have a local comic shop in your area, pay them a visit. They would be, they would love to talk to you about everything and anything graphic novels. Um, I would say tap your patrons. They would be experts on the things that they love. And of course, use your internet to see what other libraries are doing and recommending. And one of the most important things I want to tell librarians is that if you that you should probably have an explicit directive regarding graphic novels in your library's collection development policy. So this will ensure that if the person who is maintaining that collection leaves, there are guidelines in place on how to handle the graphic novel collection in the future. And let's see if we have any questions for you nice people. Um, there's one that says, I'd like to start a graphic novel group online because I have rabid graphic novel and comics readers in my library, but what can I do with respect to sharing the resources, word searches, or coloring pages? Hey, Rosemary. Um, this is a great question, and I think that um, uh, many of the publishers I know are putting a whole lot of resources online, um, including us. And we are, we're sharing stuff on Twitter all the time. We're having interactive uh, draw along sessions with people. Um, also on the Penguin Random House website, we're having uh, teacher's guides, discussion guides, all, all that sort of thing. And as well as us doing that, um, you have kids publishers like First Second and Scholastic Graphics who are putting those resources up as well. And, you know, comics publishers like Boom and Paper Cuts and um, No Brow who are, who are doing that too. So it's just checking out all of the resources that these, these people do um, is great. And then, you know, maybe, maybe the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable is gonna work on a reference list or something like that of, of different places to find materials. Okay, um, we have one other question. Do you think libraries will ever eventually get to the point where graphic novels will be mixed into standard genre shelving or would this defeat the purpose of graphic novels? We're already seeing a little bit of that, um, especially with our adult nonfiction, non nonfiction graphic novels are being shelved within memoir and shelved uh, within um, um, history, or I guess uh, historical nonfiction. Um, so I think it's slowly happening. I don't think it defeats the purpose. I think that there could be a lot of opportunities to cross shelve. Is that, is that, a, is that a term? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to have things in a graphic novel section and then also have them within the genre sec section, which, which they fit. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Jack and I. I've heard, you know, I've heard some people who love for graphic novels to say a separate thing, but I do think the more they're integrated into the traditional um, reading categories and reading sections, the more we break down those in, those I think intellectual and emotional barriers that keep us from accepting them as books. Like we've, uh, you know, I think we there's I have, I'm not going to be an expert on the on the etymology of graphic novel, but I still call them comics sometimes because it's the format and I love it. And I, and I think, uh, like I said, personally, I benefited just as much from reading Chris Claremont and Jim Lee's X-Men um, to help my increase my vocabulary and become a better student um, as I did from reading, uh, reading the Hardy Boys or, or reading uh, whatever else that my parents put in front of me and said I, I should read uh, to, to, become a, to become a more interested and capable uh, reader and student. So I think 
the more the sooner they're integrated, the sooner we can actually reap the, all the benefits from, as I think Jack made the point earlier, both uh, reading and visually experiencing uh, comics, because those are two different parts of your brain that you're teaching. Um, and I think uh, that's what makes comics such a complete creative experience. I'm actually not the biggest advocate for intershelving. Um, I've, I've heard from some libraries that have done it, who've just like intershelved their complete prose collection where graphic novel by author's last name goes on the shelf next to prose. And, you know, what they find is that their circulation goes up, which is amazing. Uh, but also when I talk to, when I look at that compared to libraries that start graphic novel sections, what seems to happen is that the, the circulation of the graphic novel section is higher in the libraries that have a dedicated graphic novel section than the graphic novels are in the libraries with the books that are intershelved. And I think that's because people are interested in graphic novels specifically. Like people are interested in them as a format and people want to go and browse the graphic novel shelves and look at them and say, I really liked my favorite thing is monsters. What is else is on the shelf that I'm gonna really like to read? And it's tough to do that when you're like, I'm looking for a graphic novel in the fiction section of the library because there's just so much fiction that if what you're looking for is a comic and you don't already know the name or the author, it's tough to find, um, especially because there's so much fewer, so many fewer graphic novels than there are prose books. Um, so I, I'm really a fan of separating out graphic novels by age category, but putting them together in a specific place so that graphic novel readers are able to find graphic novels because in many cases, that's what they're coming for. And I'd, I'd have to agree with Gina. I think I'm in her camp. Um, you know, Comics, graphic novels, manga is a category. Within that category, we've got all genres. We publish sports, horror, fantasy, science fiction, romance, um, you name it, it's, it's published. Um, I do know a couple of librarians who took the Junji Ito horror manga books out of the category and put them in the horror prose section of, of, their, of their library and the checkouts dropped significantly. As soon as they put them back into the category, the checkouts went right back up again. So I would be a, an advocate for keeping it all separate. When I started um, working at libraries a thousand years ago, um, the graphic novel section was two bays of books, maybe 10 shelves under a staircase in the back. And they were still like one of the most popular the, there were people, kids and grownups just like plopped on the stairs and reading them. So then we had to advocate for more shelf space. And then the Cirque just went up to the point where we had to dedicate an entire room for just graphic novels and manga. And then we had the problem of series can be written by different authors. So if you shelve it by author, they won't see the series. So do we put it? So we ended up shelving things by series so that every patron be like, oh, I need the Spider-Man Invincible. Let me go get that one as opposed to interfiling, but it took a long time. And granted, this was a thousand years ago. So they've come a long way in comics, but I know that they have more to go. So we have one other question. It says, all the publishers seem excited about the BGNA list. What specifically is important about it? And thank you for a great chat. I mean, graphic novels for adults, they're, yeah. they're so good. Um, you know, oftentimes we, what we see is that the kids graphic novels are recognized by the awards and those awards are a big deal in the library community and a big deal on the national level. But oftentimes graphic novels are less recognized by them, especially because many of the adult awards are thought of as more literary and graphic novels as a category have a rep an undeserved reputation for not being literary. So the fact that the ALA is stepping forward and creating a graphic novel list for adults um, is amazing, especially because a lot of the librarians who've been at the forefront of library graphic novel development in library have been kids in YA graphic novels. 
Um, my, my suspicion is that there are more adult librarians who are hesitant about graphic novels and who haven't been dedicated graphic novel readers who have a challenge bringing them into their library because it's a whole category they didn't they didn't grow up reading and it's just now showing up on their radar. So ALA providing a resource for them for collection development is fantastic. Yeah, I think it's going to help with the, again, the long term struggle that we've been fighting for so many years um, that graphic novels, or in the end, I think comics and graphic novels are, comics is the medium, graphic novels, just the books. Um, comics are, um, a broad medium that can hold a lot of different kinds of information and definitely um, are things that adult readers can be interested in. And um, ALA being such a powerful voice in the book reading world, this will really encourage more librarians and more readers to feel more comfortable reading comics everywhere in public in their homes. <laughs> that looks like it might be all the questions we have from everyone. So I do want to thank everyone who joined us this afternoon and a big thanks to our publishers for sharing their thoughts and expertise with us today. Today's webinar will be available on the GNCRT YouTube channel in about a week or so, and with links to all the resources that were mentioned. So stay safe and healthy, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Sandra, for taking the time to do this. It's been really great. And thanks to Tina and Amy, who, what would we do without you guys? <laughs> Thank you, I had a blast. Fantastic to talk to you, uh, to talk with all of you great publishers and to talk to you all amazing librarians. Yeah, thank you so much. I think, like, uh, I think as Jack and Gina both mentioned, with the with the award that we're so all excited about, and the list we're so excited about, um, it's just great to have ALA so strongly behind the graphic novels, uh, comics as a as a medium, and it's uh, we appreciate the platform you give all of us and the chance for all of us to connect. I haven't spoken to Jack in like eight years. A long time. Yeah. So this is this is fun for me. I haven't seen Gina in a year. Kevin, we've never spoken, but now we're best <laughs> friends. So exactly. this is this is uh, this is really great. So thank you. Yes, thank you to everybody at publishers, especially to ALA and to all the librarians out there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, team. Bye, everybody. Bye.